Thank you for joining us for GitOps Days. Um, if you didn't make it yesterday, no problem. As long as you're registered, everybody will get early access to recordings as well as the GitOps kits. So any friends uh, who want to join um, or can't make it today, uh, make sure that they register at gitopsdays.com so that you guys will have early access and repeated access to great resources that we'll have. And one of the great resources that we'll have is called the GitOps Conversation Kit that I'll be curating together with um, proof points, uh, quotes, um, ways to message and all that to help you move the needle with GitOps. And we'll have uh, materials from this event, especially from roundtables like this one, which is called the GitOps Conversation Kit Roundtable. Um, if you did make it yesterday, we had another roundtable that was focused on people um, in leadership positions uh, or people who have worked with um, peers in leadership positions to see what types of metrics are important and what types of talking points are ways in which they could share priorities and see that um, many ways that they are a joint team uh, in many ways they can be a joint team through understanding the value of GitOps. Um, so today's roundtable is um, more for um, dev and platform teams. So um, if you have dev and platform teams and you want to share with them why they should be thinking about GitOps and why it'll help them, we've got four, <laughs> a pretty jam-packed roundtable, and that's why I'm starting a little early here. We've got four amazing speakers who will share their stories uh, about what they've done, how they've trained up people, um, how they spread the message, and how they've really um, um, kind of create empowered people to then uh, teach others and, and keep the message going um, once they understood and took the small steps um, toward GitOps. Um, as hopefully you just saw in Cornelius' talk, you know, we're kind of putting out there that there might be four main principles to think of, um, and you can't do them all at once a lot of times, and she shared great ways in which you can start taking small steps, and the roundtable here will really share um, some really concrete stories on how to do that. So let me intro them. So we have Cornelia Davis, who I'm sure you've seen a lot of. She's been working very, very hard at this conference. We're very happy to have her. She'll be um, uh, moderating this roundtable and um, uh, getting through key topics that we hope will be helpful for you. Uh, we have uh, Niraj Amin, who is Director of Cloud Platform Architecture at Fidelity Investments. We're very happy to have him. We have Steve Wade, a platform lead of at Metal, be sharing stories as well. And we have Javeria Khan that hopefully some of you saw yesterday giving a, just an amazing, amazing talk. Um, Javeria is a senior site reality, reliability engineer at Palo Alto Networks. And then we also have Kingdon Barrett, some great friend of ours in the Flux community, who's an app developer at University of Notre Dame. And so with that uh, reminder to please ask your questions in the Slack channel and we'll do our very best to forward them to the roundtable participants at the end. And if we run out of time, they've been hanging out in the Slack channel. So please, please um, share your questions there. And with that, I will hand it over to our esteemed roundtable colleagues. Thank you, Tamo. And thank you, um, all of our, uh, our panelists for joining us today. Um, we, in terms of questions, my aim is that we get perhaps a, about half an hour in, um, maybe sooner, but uh, Tamo, I would invite you to interject with questions really anytime once we get beyond kind of the initial setting the stage. Um, we definitely want this to be a session where you all can participate and so the best way, again, to participate is to go into the Slack channel, pose your questions there, and Tamo is, is uh, monitoring that and will pass on the questions to us and to, to, to the panel. Will do. Thank you, Tamo. So again, uh, Tamo's already introduced by name each one of our individuals here. And so again, thank you all for uh, joining us. What I'd like to do first, in fact, is just give you all a chance to introduce yourself a little bit more fully. Please do tell us what, what it is that you do, what your role is, um, and maybe a little bit of a background on how you came to be at, in that position and how you came to be sitting here on stage at GitOps Days, which means that you've been doing something with GitOps. Just give us a little bit of a, a, a quick background. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call names to make it a little less awkward, and I'll just go in the order that I see folks here on the screen. And so, Niraj, why don't you start us off? Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, Niraj Amin. Um, I work at Fidelity Investments. I'm a platform architect. Um, I lead the EKS team. Um, and really, uh, you know, the main focus and, and kind of the goal of the team is to 
um, provide a service and, and really enable um, the, our partners, our, our other our end users to actually um, end up using the platform and kind of focus on some development work. Um, personally, I've been working with containers and Kubernetes for about the last four or five years. Um, started off with Docker, moved to Swarm, and um, I'm at you know the Kubernetes space today. Thank you, Naraj. Uh, Steve. Hey, so I'm uh, Steve Wade, platform lead at Metal. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Metal is a free uh, business account by Nationwide, designed to help small businesses start, grow, and run their business. Um, so I've been in the team for about two and a half years now. Um, I was Before this role, I was a Kubernetes consultant at a firm called Apprenda. So I was going around to different clients around the world, helping them with their kind of Kubernetes journey. Similar to Naraj, started um, with Docker about five, four or five years ago, went into Docker Swarm, um, and have been using Kubernetes since 1.2. Great, thank you very much. Javeria. Hi, I'm Javeria Khan. I'm a senior SRE at Palo Alto Networks in the foundational infrastructure team. Um, at the moment, I lead our on-prem Kubernetes infra. Uh, I've been in software for the past about three, uh, six years now, and I've been using Kubernetes for the past three. So over this time, I've been in multiple infrastructure type teams as DevOps and systems, and as the industry now likes to call it, SRE. So the way we got started was um, I built many clusters over this time and built a lot of infrastructure. So GitOps was just a way to improve processes and to bring better um, things into place. Excellent, thank you. And last but not least, Kingdon. Hi, I'm Kingdon Barrett and I'm an application developer on the University of Notre Dame OIT uh, Employee Finance Solutions team. Uh, I'm a Ruby on Rails dev, and that's where my focus is. Um, I come to be involved with Kubernetes a number of years ago through uh, working on open source project Deus Workflow. Oh, very interesting. I know that, that product um, pretty well. So, uh, so what you can see is that we have, we actually have quite a number of platform and even platform to infrastructure level folks and Kingdon. And if you listened to my talk just a moment ago, you also heard that I come from a developer background. So Kingdon, I'll, I'll, I'll link elbows with you. We'll be the developers that are on the, uh, on the panel today. Um, so really just to set the stage is that we have platform teams that are increasingly and, and very often responsible for providing a set of services to developers and the developers are responsible for delivering applications to their end consumers. Um, and so to a large extent, what, what, what I want to explore here in the panel today is um, the relationship between those different organizations. And that's why I'm so delighted that we have all of you um, uh, representing the different layers in the stack. And the, in, in the stack that I'm actually talking about to give everybody kind of a visual is the typical, well, we've got infrastructure at the base layer so that infrastructure might be the actual hardware increasingly virtualized um, compute storage and network. Um, then we've got the platform, and by platform there, I really mean kind of the platform that's going to be the thing that we serve up to the developers. The developers aren't touching the infrastructure. The platform acts as that abstraction layer in between, and that's really where Kubernetes is playing a huge role. And then we've got the application tier on top. So we've got application teams, platform teams, and I want to talk a little bit about as we think through this GitOps conversation, some of those conversations are going to cross those divides and some of those conversations are happening within those, those teams. So I'm very interested as we go through the, the hour in hearing your perspectives on both tips for bringing your colleagues within your own teams on, along, how you're enabling developers, what developers need from platform teams, as well as if you want to touch upon any kind of um, conversations with leadership that you think are relevant. So with that, I'm just going to kind of get us teed off again. I'll call on names this first time through, um, but then we'll start to, to, to take a little bit less of a formal approach. But um, Naraj, I'd love to start with you again. Um, you are a platform team. You said EKS in particular. Um, and I know that I've spent some time chatting with you over the last week. I know that you are very much dedicated to serving your developers. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about that in particular? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, so when I when I talk about platform and you kind of teed it up with the, the intro there, um, we're really talking about the infrastructure component of things. Um, obviously, you know, EKS and Kubernetes plays a big role there. And then we also um, have about uh, 15 or 16 different components um, that we provide as a way to enable um, these developers. So that might be um, things like, uh, you know, the ALB ingress controller, external DNS, um, et cetera, et cetera, that are open source. Cluster Autoscaler is another example. Um, and there are also operators that we've written in-house to kind of mesh um, fidelity, um, you know, the ecosystem, the environment, back to um, you know certain standards that we have and security, et cetera, and mesh it back to Kubernetes. Um, so for us, we um, version our platforms in Git um, and really provide a service and an automation um, for the various end users to uh, upgrade the platform. Um, the goal is for them to not really worry about the platform at all um, and really um, have a mechanism to kind of automate everything and, and kind of really use uh, the platform as um, you know, a standard um, uh, to deploy to. Now, some of those things that you mentioned, things like ELBs and cluster autoscalers and things like that, I mean, arguably those are already available. They're available in the AWS console. What are you doing to, when you say platform, it almost sounds like you're rebundling those things. Yeah, we are bundling them. I mean, um, so some of them we are, some of them we've written in-house, right? And really, the, these are all Kubernetes constructs, right? So certain operators. Um, and, and we really um, want to mandate um, really a, a bundling, as you mentioned, right? Of, of all these things together, um, to what we call as a platform. And that, that also includes simple things like infrastructure-related type of stuff as well. So uh, as an example, if we were to release um, or make a change to an ingress rule for a security group, um, that would be um, for us another version of the platform. Um, and eventually, um, whether it be a DevOps team, an SRE team, or the development team itself, um, depending on, on the business unit or um, depending on the environment, um, they would then be able to upgrade their platform to include this new set of features, um, which is really, as you mentioned, a bundling of different operators, infrastructure code, et cetera, et cetera. All right, I'm going to come back to some notions there in just a moment, but I'd like to actually turn to you, Kingdon, um, because Niraj was just talking about providing some services to the developer. He was talking about a bundling, so having a slightly more opinionated um, platform. How does that all sound for you as an application developer? You know, that makes me feel really, um, it, it sounds good. It sounds like something we need more of in my organization. We have a lot of the um, uh, primitives that you're talking about, ELBs, we are in the cloud, uh, but where we're at right now, we haven't really adopted Kubernetes. Um, so we've, we've used it in some small use cases like for CI pipeline. Um, and when it comes to uh, devs who are interested in this stuff that wanna deliver their software in containers, many don't because we're not really given the facilities that are required to do it in a safe and secure manner. Uh, things like uh, container registry or uh, GitOps pipeline. Um, uh, it's, it's very important uh, to have these things taken off of my plate as an application developer so I can focus on the work of application development rather than solving these problems. Yeah, I find it interesting that you say we're not Kubernetes users yet because um, Kubernetes, to some extent, we think of it as container orchestration, but what you and Naraj are describing is Kubernetes as an abstraction layer that gives you kind of, if you will, a way of surfacing a platform and, and, and making the, the, the infrastructure kind of fall away as implementation details of that platform. Um, and then Naraj, you talked about a, a, a GitOps process where you can just change an ingress rule, and that has the effect of updating the platform for the developers. Kingdon, I'm gonna circle back with you on some of this, um, some of these topics as well, but let's continue on kind of setting the stage here. Steve, I'd like to turn to you. Um, tell us a little bit about, I know that you're using GitOps to manage your platform, kind of in the way that I just hinted at what Naraj was saying around the ingress rules but you're also bringing GitOps to the developers directly. Can you say a little bit about that? 
Sure. So I think it's important for us to make sure that we get the abstraction right between the, what the platform offers and how the developers interact with it. So for us, the platform needs to enable this self-service mechanism, allowing the engineers to be able to innovate, right? Essentially, the platform is there for them to be able to innovate, to be able to bring business value to Metal and our customers. So we use GitOps as a kind of abstraction layer for them to onboard new microservices uh, into the platform or onto the platform. And we also use it as an audit trail. So the, the great thing about a tool like Flux um, is the fact that it writes back to Git. So we have an audit trail in Git of all the changes that have happened to all environments uh, in, a, in a single cohesive location. And I think why that's important as well is because we, with, with GitHub, we have the ability to use the PR mechanism as the gates of entry. So with aggressive CI, using things like deprecation checks, Helm linting, uh, using HRVAL, um, or even using tools like KubeVal to do strict linting against the JSON schema of the API that we're currently running. That provides us with more confidence that by the time that that, Q that Kubernetes manifest or that Helm release actually hits that environment, we've got a high level of confidence that it's going to work. So the abstraction is the kind of Helm release and then we've enabled these guardrails for developers with some strict aggressive CI to make sure that we try and capture as many mistakes as we possibly can. So it's been kind of a, an 18 month journey in getting there, um, but I think it's really paying dividends. And I know that we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Interesting. Now, Javeri, I know I've seen you do talks before where you talked, for example, about a very concrete example where you, um, you, went through a process of extracting some of the operational things from the CI pipelines. So there, there might've been operational things that were embedded in a CI pipeline and that, that inadvertently led to, to mistakes. And so my read, my understanding from, from that dialogue was that you were, if you will, taking again, some of these concerns that the developer might've been burdened with in the past, extracting them out and putting them in a different layer. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure, yes. So um, from my perspective as a platform builder, we were actually trying to solve a few issues. And like you said, taking that burden off from the developer because um, they can inadvertently do some changes that cause uh, further harm to the system. So, Basically by taking out the deployment part out of the CI, that firstly helped improve our security aspect of the infra. So we were just basically using the cloud version of Circle CI at the time. And we had to, of course, um, open up security group rules to allow that access into our cluster for deployments. And um, that was just the design at the time. So I don't think I need to explain why that's not a great idea. And besides, even if you do run your CI inside of your infra, you will still have multiple clusters and hopefully in isolated networks though, but the CI system will need to be given access to each one of them. And it isn't just um, security at this point, it's also manageability because as uh, your infrastructure grows, um, this will become an issue. And this is where decoupling that CI from ops really helps. So like, for example, with the Flux model, um, you can have the CI um, only build and push artifacts such as Docker images. And then you can have your convergence tools such as Flux uh, running in separate clusters. Um, they can pick up and they can apply these changes automatically. So you've definitely improved the security aspect on that side. And also subsequently, since the Flux reconciler controllers are managing the cluster objects now, um, people won't be able to do changes to them directly. So you're taking that control away from them, but you're also making it um, uh, not as easy for people to make mistakes. and. Um, as you limit edit access, uh, you can uh, do like user-based role at based access to your clusters as well. And this is obviously important as teams grow. And uh, lastly, you get those great version histories uh, for all the cluster changes that you do. Excellent. So just in that kind of brief tee up from each of you, the theme that I'm starting to see come out here is this tension between control and um, flexibility. And so each one of you have talked about constraints. And Kingdon, when I ask you about it, you said, oh, that sounds great. It, you know, get, get me away from the infrastructure. Um, but I personally know a fair number of developers out there who, as soon as you use the word constraint or you use the word guardrail, they get 
you know, the, the hair on the back of their neck stands up. They're like, wait, don't constrain me. Don't, I don't need guardrails. I know what I'm doing now. Kingdom, you said that sounds great to me. Um, I imagine that you've had a little bit of both and maybe one of the platform engineers can first talk a little bit about maybe some pushback that you got when you started talking about constraints or guardrails. Do you use different words? I'll let any one of you chime in. I'll come back to you in a second, Kingdon. Yeah, I mean, I can go, Cornelia. I mean, so yes, I mean, um, really, and, and the guardrails that we have in place are really around the security requirements, right? So Fidelity is a financial company. We have, um, you know, FINRA regulation, SOC 1, et cetera. Um, so we really need to um, ensure that the platform is, is highly secure, um, uh, especially because we deal with money, right, um, and, and, and folks' money. So um, it's, it's, it's extremely important um, to get that right. Um, and, and really, the one other thing that I quickly wanted to mention was um, we're also, as from a platform perspective, I've tried to do things um, where we have uh, many Kubernetes clusters, medium-sized clusters, not really large clusters. So we have to do things um, across uh, scale. So we're up to um, you know uh, several hundred uh, clusters now. Um, uh, so we really need to do things um, across the board in a consistent uh, manner. And, and the GitOps and, and really the Flux Helm operator that we use really helps us get there. But back to your original point, yeah. So uh, I mean, uh, the security component of things are, are um, highly uh, important. So um, th that, that's key for us. <clears throat> If it goes beyond security, um, I also, again, from, from chats that we've had in the last week or so, I've, you've also used the expression, and I'll tee it up for you, is we want to get out of the way of the developers. So what I think I'm hearing you say is that there's certain things that are uncompromising. Security is uncompromising. We don't, aren't going to trust everyone to do the right thing, which I think is really smart. Um, that doesn't mean that they, they don't care. They don't have some awareness. But instrumenting some of that stuff, of, of course, is, is very sound, sound practices. But you also talked about getting out of the way of the developers. So you do give them a fair, just very limited set of guardrails? Yeah, and that, that's correct. I mean, um, and, you know, uh, we're very transparent in terms of what security we have in place and why. Um, so, so that's there. Um, and uh, we do, um, uh, outside of the, those security requirements, we are very open. Um, we do support um, multiple patterns. Um, so I wouldn't say like, uh, you know, tens, but there are a handful of patterns that will support, for example, um, within the platform for doing some things like secret management, um, things like, uh, you know, using um, uh, persistent storage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so th there's many things there, but we try to leave um, flexible options that are highly secure. <clears throat> now, on those patterns, how do you how do you train your developers to understand those patterns? Yeah, so um, we're getting there. Um, it, it's a process. Um, we have uh, tons of working groups. So we have bi biweekly working groups where um, we we you know kind of um, let developers know what's coming, um, the reasoning behind that. Uh, have an, uh, documentation and implementation guides on, on how to best use that, uh, and then we also have. Um, uh, uh, weekly um, office hours. So um, parts of, you know, the team rotates in terms of, of joining these office hours and kind of um, gets experience, um, you know, working side by side with the developer to kind of enable something, whatever that feature set happens to be. Excellent. Steve or Javeria, do you have any other things from the platform? Developer, how, guardrails? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, just to expand briefly on what Nirad said, uh, I feel when you go from one cluster to multiple ones and all of them are accessible from within the same terminal and your automation is so good that it's trivial to sort of switch context, um, it's easier for people to make mistakes. So the guardrails are there in place to help them as well. Um, it's very easy to be, uh, think that you're uh, changing something in a staging context while you might be doing it in production instead, or you're scaling down an application you think is staging or your dev environment, but it's actually production. So uh, those guardrails, obviously, they help us as the platform people. They also help the developers uh, to sort of create breakages for the rest of the system as well. Yeah, I think to Javeria's point, right, not every uh, developer is a Kubernetes guru, and nor should they have to be. So using these guardrails is the way to be able to make sure that, you know, the experience and expertise that 
somebody that is familiar with Kubernetes has can put into a CI pipeline to help them catch those maybe mistakes or issues that they make before they get anywhere near an environment is a, is a godsend to us, right? And it's an iterative pattern that we go on explaining to them why we've put these CI uh, jobs in, the reason behind them, what they're gonna catch. Um, and now it's a process whereby they are familiar enough with the CI pipeline that between themselves, you know, nine times out of 10, they can figure out what the problem is. Maybe it's a missing quote, maybe it's a missing semicolon. Um, but as long as we keep it away from the platform and we keep it in that PR, um, we're under control. So the same way that we deploy to um, our staging environment is the same way that we deploy to production. So it's just as serious. So the more we can catch up front, the better. Interesting. Um, now, Kingdon, you said you're not a Kubernetes shop yet. And so when we hear people like Steve, when we hear Steve say, you know, some people don't need to be Kubernetes experts, tell me about your developer colleagues and, um, you know, you're not a Kubernetes shop. So do you have developers that want to learn Kubernetes? Do you have lots of developers who are like, you know what, I don't even care. Just let me stay within my code. Tell me a little bit about how all that feels to you and your colleagues. Right. We definitely have a spread of people. Some people are interested and many people are not. And I think that's fine. Um, and I have a lot of respect for the people that are hyper-focused on what they have to do. Um, but I want to go back to the constraints topic because uh, the way that the, you know, we do have a deployment system, even if we're not using Kubernetes in production, it is fairly well nailed down. Um, and one of the constraints that we struggle with is the lead time to deploy a new service um, around how, uh, if we want to build a service that uh, makes a lot of sense as a microservice, we, we don't really tend to think that way because we know it's going to be about two weeks um, up front if we want to get a new microservice deployed. And uh, if, if uh, we want to take it to production, which obviously we will, it's going to be another two weeks when it's time to go to production. Um, and that's a long time when your whole project micro project timeline is eight weeks. So what typically happens is it gets bolted onto an existing monolith of some kind. Um, I'm not sure if I strayed too far from your question, but uh, it's, it's kind of the way that the constraints inform or pre-decide our architecture. Um, this is where I was trying to focus. Precisely. And, and so what you're describing is a constraint that you don't have Kubernetes. So there are some very fixed constraints. So as you said, you end up bolting things onto a, an existing monolith because that's the only way that you can meet your, your timeline. So again, there's this tension. So what you've got is some constraints. And it, but it's slightly different because when we move over to the platforms that our other colleagues here are talking about are, are where those constraints are, are keep in mind some of these requirements around modern application delivery, um, speed of delivery, frequency of delivery, and those types of things. So it's a different set of constraints. Yeah, and when we build these monoliths and we keep building them larger, they tend to get larger and more complex. And that's uh, pattern or anti-pattern by itself that we really would like to avoid if we could. So if we could remove some of those constraints and get us on Kubernetes, I think that would help a lot based on my experience. Yeah. So Naraj, you talked about kind of a weekly workshop. Um, any, Steve or Javaria, are there any other like types of workshops or trainings or kind of ways of engaging your developer community to help them understand the platform that you are building and the, the, the free, the, how constraints can actually free them? Sure, I think for us, the way that we do it at, at Metal is um, by bringing these teams closer to us, right? So for me, the tech is easy. The difficult part is the people and the culture and in breeding the reasons behind why we make certain decisions as a platform team. So we had to go on this journey with the developers and explain to them why we were restricting their access. No, you can't push changes into the cluster, we're gonna pull them. Oh, well, you mean that I can't have this, you know, I can't have the ability to be able to delete things. Well, that's not really great, is it? Um, you know, you're restricting us. You're supposed to be building this new platform to enable us and you're taking things away from us. So then it was a journey for us to bring in these teams, you know, each of the mission teams and onboard a couple of their microservices um, into this pattern, using that as a way to document the pattern and then them playing it back to the engineers within their teams. And then we kind of get that, that natural distribution. 
So we've done that with a number of mission teams now, and it's now the case where new people are onboarded into those mission teams, and we don't need to have the same kind of conversations because the people that were there at the beginning are the people that are still there now. So the way they document that could be different between teams because there's different ways of understanding the, you know, the abstraction. But we've got a general purpose uh, platform wiki that we actually deploy using Flux. So we GitOpsify our wiki as well. Uh, that's a general platform wiki. And then uh, the developers have their own ways of writing, you know, how do we onboard a new microservice? How do we create a new Kafka topic? And for us, it was, defining those boundaries and making it so self-service that uh, back to, I think it was uh, Javeria's point of for them to be able to deploy a new microservice without having to contact us means that the abstraction is right. Right now, it's not 100%. There's still some work to do. This process is never completed. But when they can truly onboard a microservice without having to talk to us, the abstraction is right. It allows them to be able to innovate and it allows us to be able to innovate the platform. Think, thinking about things like better observability, how do we, you know, how do we have a better approach to uh, release cutover and things like that, allowing them to, you know, deploy their microservices, add new functionality, and uh, provide better um, features to our customers. Yeah. So similar to what Steve said, um, in my experience uh, at the startup, it was a slightly different process because the team wasn't as large. Um, and uh, I've noticed that people obviously process things better in different ways and different mediums. So it's about communicating enough. Uh, obviously you make sure everything's documented uh, for when people need to go back to that and figure out how to do the new steps. Um, you also uh, sort of hold sessions for everybody. You make sure that they're recorded uh, for the bigger companies, for like the enterprise uh, place that I'm in now. We have this concept of brown bag sessions because there are multiple teams that you are now servicing and um, it's easier to just hold these sessions for whoever can attend and explain the new processes to them. And you also make sure that they're recorded for anybody who wants to go back to that information later. Um, also, uh, there's no such thing as over communicating new changes, I believe. So you just make sure that everybody um, has the information where they need it. And obviously you're available for direct um, answers and uh, questions as well. That's great. Now, I'm wondering whether any of you have like a really great turnaround story. I'll share one of my turnaround stories. And quite a number of years ago when I was at the EMC CTO office, I was working with a colleague who had spent his career in uh, mainframes. So very, very stable systems that only released every 18 to 24 months, that type of a thing. And this was at a time when we were starting to play with our first open source project. Um, in, it was Cloud Foundry, actually. And my colleague was standing this stuff up and it was early days. And so every day there was something changing. And I spent times, you know, debating with him. He would say, this is never going to go anywhere because it changes all the time. And I was like, dude, that's the way of the future. It's always changing, you know, move into the, the modern age. And we just fought about this for months. And then six months later, I joined, or I don't know, three months later, I joined a conference call a little late, just in time to hear him say that to another group to say, well, you know, the way the modern enterprise is, is open source is changing all the time. And that was one of those like brilliant moments where you just like somebody who was a complete detractor has come totally on board. Does anybody have a story like that to share? Yeah, I think we have quite a prevalent one, right? So Meta is a venture with inside a, a larger, more incumbent bank, uh, NatWest. So the venture was spun up to prove out ways of working, right? They, they, it's To your point, it's a very slow moving, slow paced environment. The technology never really changes. Um, they didn't believe that we could spin up a brand new environment from absolutely nothing in about 20 to 30 minutes. They just didn't think it was possible. So we videoed it. We videoed it from count, creating the account in Amazon all the way to the platform coming up um, and actually having workloads running on it and us being able to hit URLs. Um, and going into those meetings and actually seeing their faces, you know, the video never lies, right? So the ability for us to be able to show that to them, show them that the technology works, show them that these new cool kind of bleeding edge practices that we've implemented are actually serving us up, serving us well. Um, and being able to prove that, you know, in, a, in, an, in an incident or a major outage, our kind of mean time to recovery is now 20 to 30 minutes. And if we ask the question back to them, you know, there's, there's, they don't really know. And I think now in the, in the modern era, luck, we're lucky enough to be able to leverage things like the cloud. 
but to be able to know the answer for how quickly we can rebuild an environment, I think is, you know, speaks to the patterns that we've Im implemented. Yeah, I mean, I, I can add some stuff there as well, Cornelia. So, I mean, um, in previous places I've been, um, this has been a kind of a, a, a heated debate. Um, and, and I think um, it, it's a journey, right? Um, I, we're kind of on the journey um, to kind of get there um, here as well at Fidelity. Um, but it is it is a new mindset. Um, I, I think you know, uh, as long as um, the processes, whether that be you know uh, integration tests or uh, unit tests, et cetera, are in place, I think um, to, to Steve's point, uh, rebuilding an environment is, is or a platform, even such, is is um, really not that hard anymore. Um, you know, similar to, to, to Stephen Metal, I mean, uh, at Fidelity, we can build out a new platform within about thirty to forty five minutes now. Um, so. That's kind of the no longer um, like it has been in, in years past. Really, the 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 um, and, and to kind of Kingdom's point um, earlier, it really isn't the um, the long stick in, 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 when you when you measure um, you know time time to production or, or whatever that case may be. Excellent. Well, uh, Tomo, I would like to turn to you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Excellent. Hey. Uh, yes, so we had a couple trickle in, so that they've been over time, um, but I think it's good for some repetition anyway. Um, so Neeraj, you had a, a question early on. You had been talking about the platform that you had built, and um, so one person was asking, um, you know, what was the effort required to build this kind of platform? And I think that's a fantastic question because it's a helpful platform. But what was the uh, yeah, what was the startup cost in a way? Yeah, benefit. I mean, so um, it's been a journey. Um, so we started um, before I even joined Fidelity, but um, I, I would say it was about about six to nine months. Um, and, and really, uh, to kind of uh, call out some of the the more difficulties. Um, so uh, again, um, it, it's not so much uh, the platform itself, but it's really meshing back to the Fidelity environment, right? So we had to um, develop and build a lot of in-house operators to kind of bridge the gaps um, that were really fidelity specific requirements, whether they be security. Um, we built an operator uh, as an example for, for multi-tenancy. So uh, we mesh back to Fidelity's AD, back to a namespace, back to, an, uh, since we're using AWS, IAM. So all that, we really wanted to make it easy for the end developer and kind of be in a self-service state. Um, so that's kind of some of the legwork that we had to go through. Um, but I would say about six to nine months to kind of get fully up and running and where we are today with, you know, um, hundreds of clusters out in production. Awesome. Excellent. Um, then we have another question for uh, Javeria and actually quite a few for you. Uh, the first one is um, someone saying um, our challenge is security and governance. Um, so in an enterprise model, like what were some of the challenges that you dealt with and how did you, how did you get through them and how are you in the process of getting through them? So going from a startup to an enterprise model, I suppose the biggest change is the size of the infra. So at a startup, you've got like a few, uh, like four or five number of clusters, and now we have 40 on bare metal nodes across various data centers in the world. Um, just managing the whole uh, sort of aspect of access and um, security and governance of that person also asked as well. So uh, it's important here to put in these kinds of controls and guardrails that we were talking about earlier. So as, uh, for example, you're building clusters and you're making sure that the correct RBAC roles are in place and then not all users are allowed to access and teams are given their own namespaces and they can only access those namespaces. And a lot of teams want access to the dashboard as well. So you have to make sure you create that many user accounts and user tokens so they have access to only their views. Um, so that kind of stuff we had to put a lot of uh, thought into and also making sure that this stuff was repeatable and scalable across all the different clusters that you make and you keep making. Uh, the other challenge I think I had, this is not exactly GitOpsy, but there was a certain way that we were building out clusters here at the moment. Um, we were maintaining our own internal distribution, so to speak. Um, that isn't very um, sustainable. It isn't very scalable as you move forward. Uh, so I moved that over to using an open source deployment tool called Kubespray. Um, that's nicely source controlled. You can fork it. You can keep the files locally. Um, you can do your changes on them. So it's GitOps in the way that you can keep the version for yourself. And then you also get the upstream bug fixes and any improvements that they do. 
So going from managing your own distribution to actually using an open source tool that has everything nicely baked in was um, just socializing that, getting everybody on board, uh, telling them this is how we should change around everything. Because, because this is a big change as you're building up production clusters, um, get, getting everybody on board onto the aspects of changing an entire infrastructure of uh, uh, the base model of how things are going to be structured. is, is it needs a lot of socializing, it needs a lot of talking. So it took a few months to get that um, in place, but uh, I'm glad it finally happened. And we now have production clusters and we're slowly starting to move traffic over to them for the new model. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, and then we have a great question, I think, for everybody. Um, so uh, Cornelia's earlier talks talked about some of the principles and how to get started. Like, how, how can you start taking small steps? Uh, so it'd be great to hear um, what your actual first steps are, because someone was asking, you know, it's really hard to find a starting point to embrace GitOps in my organization with our existing CI CD infrastructure. You know, where do I start? How do I evaluate which GitOps method is best for me? How do I decide which features are important for my organization? So a bit broad, but very, very valid. And thank you. Thank you for that question. So uh, maybe we can see if our roundtable people uh, have either started or are considering the starting points that are similar or different to what Cornelia was uh, suggesting earlier. Yeah, I, I think from a starting point, start with something that you're familiar with that has a small blast radius, right? If that thing doesn't work, then it's not going to be the end of the world. So for us, just a dashboard, right? Dashboard not being online is, you know, it's it's not great, but it's not it's not an outage. So start very small, learn the learn the steps. So in terms of feature set, like it's prime example with, for me is like a service mesh, right? There's, you know, it's just like a Swiss army knife, but essentially there's, there may be one or two really key things that you want to use within that Swiss army knife. So for us with the GitOps journey, we started with the platform workloads. So we didn't touch any of the developer workloads at all. Uh, we iterated on a number of different approaches for things like how we're going to deploy the ingress controller, how we're going to deploy our Prometheus, like our monitoring stack. And we learned the lessons there learn how the auditing works, learn how the image promotion works, learn about the options you have. You, you, know, you can push new images uh, or you can get Flux to poll for those new images and learn the pros and cons of both methods and then start to distribute that slowly amongst the teams because then you're the one that's done the kind of heavy lifting. If, if you're the GitOps enthusiast um, within your organization, start with something that you're familiar with, look, look at the different approaches, see how it works, and then breed that into a couple of other um, microservices and then slowly but surely drip feed your developers into this process. That's how I would recommend doing it. Yeah, There's, for me, uh, in my perspective as an operator and as a platform architect, um, starting small for me means um, rolling out stuff and staging and dev environments first. So, for example, when you're like adding GitOps tools like Flux or Flagger to your Kubernetes environments and you should enable them on staging clusters first and get a feel of what you like and what you don't like about it. And then this really allows you to decide which of their features um, tie in better with your environment and um, how basically you're going to integrate them with your workflows. Um, so for example, when I was testing out Flux, I realized I didn't want it pulling the images directly because that kind of made rollbacks harder. And instead I just changed the CI to update the image key and the YAML configs and the config repos. And this was also beneficial for keeping the deployment specs up to date. So basically any kind of new thing that you're starting out with, just start out with a dev uh, environment within your infra. And I think that that's a good first starting step. Yeah, I would add too. Um, as far as um, a dev environment, it's a great place to start. Uh, we realized that a lot of it um, slowdowns have actually been deliberately introduced um, to constrain change in a way that might be important for our organization uh, or, or deliberate that we want to move slowly. Um, and that doesn't necessarily work for developers who are asked to move quickly, um, internally at least. Um, so solving small problems and making sure that um, the development environment can take advantage of these things is a way that we can get started where the blast radius is reduced. And, and uh, if the dev environment is in a private network, there's very little that can really go wrong. Right. Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, um, so just as Javeria and Steve said, we started off with the push model. Um, we started off in what we call our pilot environments um, and pilot stages. Um, and then we also um, just kind of help folks understand what GitOps is and the onboarding. 
um, we eventually had to build um, a UX layer that kind of did a git commit and push right on the behalf of a user. Um, so that was, you know, an extra layer, yes, but it did help with enablement. It did help with the evolution of kind of getting to, to um, the end state of where we want to be. But I think it'll take time and I think it'll be a process. I, I think as well, there's one other thing, right? So to, to Deveria's and uh, Niraj's point about doing it in a pilot environment or a sandbox environment, we'll take it back to your local machine, right? We've got things like Minikube. We've got things like Kind. We can actually demo this stuff well away from anything else. We've got a load of upstream public re public repositories, public Helm charts, public images. Use that and iterate locally. Try and deploy a in Nginx ingress controller to Minikube or something using Flux. Um, and then once you've built that pattern out and you start to understand the processes, then drip feed it into actual running environments that are running other workloads. Excellent. Um, yeah, and as part of that, uh, we have a, a comment just in general, just you know, a little bit of frustration of like, yeah, I just need a, a better way to explain this and move the needle, really trying to evangelize, but there's some that just really refuse adoption. So we really hope um, the GitOps conversation kit that will um, take all these together will, will help you, um, but maybe we can come to some um, advice right at the end. Um, but before that, to segue in the uh, current topic, uh, there's also, uh, question about, uh, yeah, there are few players now in the CICD arena trying to sell an all-in-one solution. Uh, do you think GitOps will force a return to the best of breeds, such as Jenkins, Jenkins X, Tecton for CI, Flux, Argo Spinnaker for CD, et cetera? So I think a great question. What are your thoughts on, on this move, poss possible move in this direction? I think for me, it's the same as the Kubernetes ecosystem or the cloud native ecosystem, right? There's so many options that you can have, and it's about choosing the best one. So now we've got a plethora of tools that we can use or that we have at our disposal. And I think the best tool for the job is the one that works for your business, the one that works for the team, the one that works for the platform. Um, I don't think there'll necessarily be a, a, um, you know, a consolidation to one or two single choices. I think you know, there's companies uh, competing for this space, there's open source distributions competing for this space, um, but it's about the tools and features that are available. Any others? Yeah, that's uh, true. I think GitOps is, uh, personally, I believe it's going to be a big driving force in the new features that these CI systems introduce. Obviously, you will choose the one that's best for your infrastructure, but like Argo CD has that stuff baked in already. Um, so the other popular ones like Circle and uh, Circle Jenkins and GitLab, um, they might slightly, they, it would help them to move towards the GitOps uh, supported frameworks as well for people as this becomes more adopted. Yes, not. I'll move to the next question. It's a little bit more of a comment, um, but one person was saying, you know, it's helped to um, ramp up devs with a self-service demo. It says in one of our sandbox environments or namespaces, and it's really helped to have Flux and Helm operator and some Git repositories for them to play around with. Um, sorry, I was multitasking a bit. It reminded me, Steve, did you end up sharing your story about how you had uh, sort of trained out your teams and then you had, uh, it was like a 12 hour upfront. I can't remember if you got to that. Yeah, we, 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 talk, get, we, talked, yeah, we talked about mission teams and how we brought them in and then they distrib distributed that knowledge back to their wider teams. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so it seems like that's a, that's a great way to do that as well. Um, so that's most of the questions. Oh, one last one, uh, there was a follow-up to Neeraj, like how many people um, did you need to build the platform? Yeah, so um, our, our team size, so um, there's about six of us. Um, so it's not entirely that big. I mean, um, we did iterate over time. Um, things have gotten better. Um, and, you know, we, we also, um, you know, to the team's credit, um, shifted uh, ideas that didn't work very quickly uh, and kind of dropped them, right? In a, in a, in a normal Agile um, framework um, kind of way. But yeah, there's only, um, there's only six folks on the team. Excellent. Um, so with the last uh, two minutes, if it's okay, I'd love to get back to the, the person asking for help. Um, I know you've covered it a little bit, but it never hurts to reiterate, like, can you share any moments where maybe you, you found resistance and whatever, uh, that you did this thing in, in your org's culture and in, in the, the stakeholders that you know, where you kind of saw the aha moment in their face and things started to turn, or maybe even with yourself, or you know, you had a lot of things to think about and suddenly you're like, okay, I've decided I'm gonna put a little bit more time into this. 
any good stories to share? Yeah, I, I think it, in terms of getting started, I think it's, you know, understand what the resistance is to change. Look at the things that the GitOps paradigm can, can help with. So for us, audit trail is, was a huge one for us. Um, I don't want to have to audit every single change. Like the developers and engineers use Concourse as their CI pipeline. And what ended up happening was that was the source of truth for the, you know, the makeup of the clusters. But now we have this nice audit trail in Git commits that we can you know, show to an auditor or show to an engineer of all the changes that have happened. And as well as that, if there's an incident, we, the first place we're going to go is we're going to go back to the changes that happened during that period. And we, we've got the Git history to be able to teach us that. So I think it's understand what their resistance to change is, implement a POC that kind of mutes that and, and shows them how this paradigm can help um, alleviate that. And then it's just a case of a journey of kind of more mass adoption. Yeah, I would say, I mean, if, if you're not getting resistance, there's probably something uh, going wrong. I mean, the resistance is good, right? It's a learning opportunity for both sides um, mm -hmm. uh, to, to kind of move forward together. Um, so I, I wouldn't be too worried about the resistance aspect of things, as long as you can kind of work together hand in hand and kind of collaborate and, and get past it. Yeah, if you're not pushing hard enough, if, if you're not breaking something, then you're not pushing hard enough. Right. So cool. So okay. I think we're running up against time. Yep. Um, and so what I'd love to do is just take a moment to ask each one of you to share one parting thought and maybe Kingdon will start with you. Oh, um, I'm putting on the spot here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I think um, one blog series that's been very helpful for me uh, is to understand how to use a remote debugger in Kubernetes that would be more like a local dev experience. Uh, has been the Octito blog. Um, and, and that's something that's, they support many languages, not just Ruby, they do have specific Ruby support. I would recommend that for developers who are um, trying to make this a smoother transition where they don't have to worry so much about um, not being able to use the local tools that they're familiar with. Yeah, so I'm gonna put you on the spot a lot more from now on because that was killer. So, uh, and Niraj? Yeah, I would say, you know, in a journey towards to GitOps, I would just say start small, um, you know, pick and choose the right solution for you. It, it's, there's no one right answer for everybody, um, depending on the size of the company, the enterprise, um, the, even maybe the business unit, right? There might be um, differing answers. So um, to, to kind of everybody's point earlier, you know, start somewhere um, and kind of build upon that. I, I think that's the right approach. Excellent. Javeria? Well, like I keep saying, um, you should definitely over communicate, um, make sure that you incorporate feedback from your users and your developers early on in your design process so that they're happy as well. And um, putting all this stuff in place is really going to help you in your security and availability and manageability of your infrastructure at the end of the day. Thank you for calling out the feedback in particular. Feedback loops are good everywhere. So, and finally, Steve. I think it's important to bring the developers closer to you, right? As a, as a platform engineer myself with Niraj, it's about engagement. We've got to engage with them. And I, I think to kind of cl close out, it's about, you know, a, a, a bunch of us on this call have found a pattern that works. So the next goal for us as a group is to share that back with you. Reach out to us on, on socials, reach out to us in the WeaveWork Slack, come and have a chat. We're, we've probably had some of the conversations that you're about to have or are having and let's kind of collaborate and see if we can all get on this journey together. Oh, brilliant. Excellent. Well, I thank you all um, for joining us again today. Uh, and I think with that, we'll hand it back over to you, Tomo.